Now today I'm um, presenting on uh, an audit that was undertaken uh, through the Blood Matters Program on consent for transfusion. It was un done last year. Um, and before I get into it, I'd like to thank the MBA for being able to present this data today. Um, and I'm also presenting on behalf of our Blood Matters team. So Claire's outlined the work that the program has undertaken about establishing um, support for consent, but I'll be presenting the data. Um, and you'll notice that Victoria has also included Tasmania ACT in the Northern Territory. We have memorandums of understanding with those uh, jurisdictions to participate within our program. So we value their support and um, interactions with our program. So our audit actually looked at measuring the current policy and practice guidelines. So we were measuring against the um, ANZ SBT and Royal College of Nursing guidelines, national standards and the RMAC um, statement, stewardship statement. We wanted to see if people's current policies and practice actually reflected those guidelines and standards. We looked at do the policies exist, what elements are included in those policies, were transfusions given with consent and did patients understand or recall what happened within that consent process. It was a three part audit. The first part was a desk desktop audit where we looked at hospital wide transfusion policy. The second part was actually auditing blood transfusion um, consent practice. So we looked at 30 randomly selected transfusion episodes within a health service. And the other part was auditing a patient's understanding or recall of consent, and that was also 30 randomly selected patients. 140 health services were invited to participate, and the data was el um, electronically entered via our website. So what did we find? Um, overall, 110 health services responded to at least one part of the audit. In relation to policy, 105 had a statement regarding consent for transfusion. Um, and there were five that didn't actually have a consent policy. The majority of respondents actually had a policy that covered what products should be covered under that um, consent process, which is actually in line with the national standard. And 95 included what sort of method of documentation should be used. Now, as you can see here from this graph, it shows the types of consent documentation that was reported. We found it quite interesting that 48% of the participating health services actually had a specific um, blood transfusion consent form. 21% uh, actually had a generic form which had a reference to transfusion. And where we've got the other greater percentage was 16% um, in other that incorporated um, multiple places of documentation, so the policy actually included documenting in the medical records as well as a consent form. And we couldn't, I mean, we didn't include this on our audit form. Now Claire has mentioned uh, that their policy included those patients who had ongoing um, care, and um, so we looked at the time frame for consent. So those patients who do require ongoing care may not need to have a consent at each um, time point unless their condition has changed or their management has changed. So the policies that were reported showed that 46% uh, had um, 6 to 12 months as the time of validity for their consent um, and 25% were between 3 and 6 months. There were I guess a smattering of other different um, areas as well, 18% for each individual admission. I guess of concern for us, there were two hospitals or two health services that responded that their policy had an indefinite time frame. So the ANZ SBT guidelines um, outline what should be included in the conversation with the patient. And so these are the elements that we uh, um, ask people to look at in their policy. So we found out that 77% of those policies included the reason for transfusion. That 84% uh, included the risks and benefits of the blood product. Now this dropped to 68% when you actually talked about the, the risk and consequent of not receiving the transfusion. And only 59% of those included other blood management strategies. Um, and the use of written information was documented in um, about 65% of the policies. But the lowest part there was 48, only 48% um, included the use of a competent um, interpreter. And given our multi multicultural um, groups these days, I think that's probably an area that we need to look at. So in those policies that were reported, who could obtain consent? 
Now, consent is actually the responsibility of the prescriber. And as you can see here, the majority of the situations um, documented that consultant medical officers or um, other registrars or interns were the people who could take consent. There were three nurse practitioners and these um, actually have it in their scope of practice um, to prescribe blood and blood products. The other area had a, a smattering of descriptions for medical staff, but it also had registered nurses. There were some hospitals that it had increased the responsibility within their policy to cover registered nurses. Those health services have now changed their policy since this audit um, came out. So in practice, what actually happened in practice? So we had 1,788 transfusion episodes reported uh, through the audit from 103 uh, hospitals. There were 75 public and 28 private. Of those episodes that were audited, there were 45% male and 55% female, and the average age was 68%. And so that, there was a really quite broad range of ages there, less than one year and up to 98. So we've kind of got the whole spectrum. But it was interesting to note that 55% of those audited were over 70 years of age. The most common pr blood product that was administered was red cells. And where patients received more than one blood product on the same day, these were also the largest proportion were red cells. Overall, informed consent was documented and valid for 75% of those transfusion episodes that were reported through the audit. Now, I thought this is a bit interesting. We actually looked at the age group of the transfusion episode um, in relation to their clinical specialty. Now, the majority of the medical uh, specialties is a medical specialty, so that's this one here. And um, you can see that the greatest proportion of those were in patients that were over 70 years of age. The next group um, is haematology oncology, and that made up 30%, followed by surgical at 28%, and then obstetrics. Now, we had no control over who under, uh, what patient groups were selected. That was up to the auditors at the um, individual health services. So that may have influenced um, the clinical uh, specialty that was audited. So in practice, who did obtain consent? As you can see, there's some differences. We've, we've put public and private up here. There were different differences between the two areas. And this would reflect actually the workforce practices within those. Um, in the private setting, there are very few registrars and interns, whereas that's a great proportion um, within the public setting. The as I mentioned before, the responsibility of consent does re um, rest with the prescriber. But it was reported that registered nurses had obtained consent. 39% of these episodes that were reported here were from those hospitals that had um, broadened the scope of consent but the rest of them were either outside the scope of their hospital policy or they had no policy that stated who could take consent. So now we're looking at the third part of the audit. What did patients understand of or recall? Because really we weren't measuring, I guess we didn't give it them a test. We are actually asking them what they recalled about the, um, their conversation around consent. So patients were asked to provide feedback, um, that, and that was usually done within 72 hours or prior to their discharge. We had a total of 1,386 episodes reported from 93 health services, and 88% reported receiving some sort of form of um, information about transfusion, with 32% of these being written information and 86% of it being verbal information. Approximately half of these people received um, information at two time points, and um, another 20% received it prior to admission, and 18% received it on admission. So when patients were asked about the information they received, the data actually confirmed that the possible risks of receiving a transfusion were explained more often than the risks of not receiving a transfusion, or the alternatives, which is only 7%. Um, the data demonstrates that there's um, significant improvement is required for those health services to both meet the standards expected of them and to comply with the national guidelines. So of the 89 patients that could recall being offered an alternative to transfusion, uh, iron replacement or iron treatment uh, was the most predominant there with being 54%. 
from our data, we're unable to determine if the low rate of alternatives um, to transfusion being offered is due to lack of knowledge from those people who are taking consent, or if alternatives were available or if they were appropriate for that patient. So we couldn't tell that. So we've made some recommendations to the health services coming um, from this audit that health services without an informed consent policy should develop one. They should make sure that it complies with the ANZSBT uh, Royal College of Nursing guidelines, comply with the national standards and also with the stewardship statement. And we've actually devised a checklist within our audit um, report so that health services can actually assess their policy to see if they're being compliant with all of those points that they need. Now two of the five health services without a policy as, um, have actually developed one following the audit and the others are actually awaiting their individual reports that they received from the Blood Matters program to give it traction and evidence so that they could take it to their executive to help them um, in, implement and drive change. For those health services who do have a policy, they should actually review it to make sure that it includes all the required elements. One area that we didn't look at in the audit was the refusal of consent, um, but this does need to be included in a, a transfusion consent policy. When we look at practice, um, we need to make sure that the consent is actually taken by the person that's prescribing it, and those roles who can take consent uh, should be clearly documented within the policy. Many health services actually require significant improvement in documenting the consent, so, so we only had 75% documentation. And we need to make sure that we involve the patient more in the decision making process and that as we've talked about many times today, that that's an area that lots of people are grappling with. Um, we need to make sure that we involve patients and talk to them about the risks and alternatives. And obviously we need to make sure that prescribers either increase their awareness of alternatives um, so that they are offered um, to patients where they are appropriate and not every situation that will be appropriate. So this is a, an example and I know it's really hard to read. Um, there are two pages of this but this is, um, you can find this in, on our web page. It's in our re, um, consent for transfusion report. And this is how we sent back the individual reports to each of the health services that participated in the audit. They actually had the percentage of yeses, so whether they complied with it and, or no. And we also um, included in the individual health service report the cumulative data as well, so they knew where they were sitting in, in relation to the whole um, audit. These were sent to the CEO, and one of our health services had come back to us and said that that was really great because their results weren't so good. And the CEO kind of took this straight to the board, and the board are now taking action. So something that she'd been trying to get in place for a while has now been actioned from the top down. So um, that's been very useful to hear that the information has been um, helpful to the, health, to the health service. Now, to assist health services in meeting the standards, we've, um, at Blood Matters, have actually put together a transfusion data collection tool. Now, this talks about documentation, which includes consent, um, talks about appropriateness and also wastage. So this tool can be customised to your health service and it does produce some lovely graphs that you can use for reporting to your hospital transfusion or quality committee. Now this is an example of the graphs that come from the audit tool and as you can see it's got prescription and consent and also the indication so that's seeing if somebody has actually documented the indication. So that's available for anybody to download and, and to modify for your health service from our website. I can't um, go on today without acknowledging, my, first of all, my team um, in, in Blood Matters and for all the hard work that they do to help getting all of these audits out, collated and then reported. To all the health services that actually contributed to the audit, I know it does take a lot of time and we do hope that the um, data that we provide back is useful and able to help you in your practice. Our Blood Matters, uh, Patient Blood Management Steering Group and our Consent Working Party we did have a number of reporters, reviewers who reviewed our report. And we'd like to thank um, the New Zealand Blood Service, Western Health here in Victoria and the ANZ SBT for some of the materials that we actually utilised um, from about consent. Now this is a picture of our website and um, if you want to download the consent for blood transfusion, it's over there. 
Um, and all the other tools are actually on there as well. So now I guess it open up to questions if we've got time for Claire yeah, and I. We have. You've done very well. Thank you. We're back on time. <laughs> questions for um, Claire or Lindley? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Chris Marks, Northern Health. Um, just two questions. One, when was the data sent out to our CEO? Because I haven't seen our data yet. It was sent um, some weeks ago, but we can, um, if you give me your email address, I can send you your copy. Thank you. That would be <laughs> lovely. Uh, especially as we've got accreditation looming. Uh, the other one was we've incorporated observation chart on our consent, so we've got all the risks and consent as well, and we've actually put observation. Now, we're in a bit of two minds, because obviously with deteriorating patient, there's a whole other. Is anybody, you know, have you got any thoughts on that? Just, you know, happy to, I'm probably gonna leave it there for a while yet, because rolling it out to, we're having it rolled out to non-ICU areas um, in phase two, so I'll, anyway, just a comment. Yeah. I guess that is something we've got our a transfusion nurse and trainer forum in November and the observation chart was something that we were going to be discussing with that to find out what everybody is doing within our um, I guess net transfusion nurse and trainer network with that but it certainly has been raised as an area of concern with the with the chart because it doesn't clearly uh, I guess reflect some of those changes that we might like to see in transfusion. Um, so it is a, a burning question. We haven't made any clear decision about it and we want to find out what the rest of our network are, are undertaking with that. And I don't know, Claire, would you make a comment on that? Oh, just to say that a lot of um, the examples of consent forms that we looked at in the working group had incorporated the risks plus the observations and the consent um, and the prescription even, all on the one form. We chose to take a more simplistic viewpoint for the template purpose but it's up to the individual health service what works best for them. About brochures, did you put anything on your consent about having brochures provided to your client and interpreters? Yes, we did. We included an interpreter section down the bottom and the patient information brochures, there's a, a link for them to access it from our intranet site. Questions? I'll just make a comment about the um, observations because um, we've had three of our services go through accreditation under the new standards and um, um, it was very clear that the surveyors preferred um, one observation chart to be used for the entire patient episode and not to be switching across to a different observation chart whilst the blood was in play because you um, don't have a baseline on that chart and so you're losing your, your um, baseline data, it's in a separate place. So just a suggestion, it might be better to get rid of it. <coughs> Thanks Susie. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that too. <coughs> Thanks. I think with um, standard nine, the deteriorating patient, most hospitals have got an observation and response chart and it seems um, not to flow to move away from that um, chart that triggers a response to a separate OBS chart when you've got a risky product like blood running. I'll just comment, that's one of the reasons Eastern Health chose not to introduce a separate one. Other questions, comments? Ah, there we go. Um, what are your plans in regards to bridging the consent or communication gap between non-English speaking patients, considering that was something that you guys highlighted? Well, I, I guess from the program's perspective, we'd like to make sure that people have it included in their policies um, that's there. We've um, in, got a number of our patient information brochures interpreted into different languages. We've purposely not replicated other ones that have been done because Bloodwatch have a, a, quite a number on the CEC website that have been done in different languages. We've chosen a few languages that are common, I guess, in some areas within Victoria. But bearing that in mind, um, not all patients can read either. So that's not always there. I know that 
the blood service is looking at a picture tool and so we we'll hope that we'll be able to work with the blood service on looking at some sort of education picture tool. And they're also looking at trying to produce some products and I know that the Northern Territory are working on something for the Indigenous population as well. So we haven't got anything yet but we are hoping that's in some of our stuff in our future plans. And I don't know Claire if you've got... Oh, just to say it, we've got um, our, our own Eastern Health brochure interpreted into nine different languages but um, we've also got links to the Blood Matters site, so if our language isn't, if the language isn't there, hopefully it will be included. Otherwise, yes, the interpreter. Is that on, mate? Just wondering, that's working, thank you. Uh, given that we have one set of national standards, is there a valid reason why we can't have one consent form for blood? <laughs> Lee, would that you would like to hard. answer that? <laughs> um, I, can, I can answer that. As part of the tool set, one of the early, I mentioned those projects that are coming first. The one I didn't mention, which comes after, um, after Cell Salvage, is patient consent. If you think you had a problem at a health service getting a consent or at a state basis, let me assure you, getting it at the national limit, you're not going to get an absolute template. What you will get is here are some suggested elements that you could incorporate it because it's just, um, well, having been a health service before this job, getting agreement on a single form in a health service is difficult. So nationally, we will present, we will produce something that provides you with guidance, and that should happen before Christmas. We're still tribal. Tribal is an understatement, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be drawing and exactly. Uh, we're already drawing on on the blood matters. We're, as I said, looking right around the nation, looking at some good examples, and drawing up and trying to produce our best practice template. Thanks. Other, yep, last one, I think. Lindley, um, in one of your slides you said a practice point was consent is responsibility rests with the prescriber. So reading between the lines a bit, are you advocating for every episode of transfusion? Um, the prescriber needs to get that consent because, I mean, um, you've got consent for 12 months, we've got consent for duration of treatment, so the person that obtained consent is not the person that's prescribing the blood product. No, I guess we'd go with what's within the guidelines for um, transfusion and that um, obviously whoever is prescribing it in the first instance if somebody has got an ongoing condition that requires and they're medi medically not going to be changing and their condition or their blood product that they're receiving is not going to change we would still abdicate that they could have it for that episode of care but the person who's taking that consent in the first place would be the prescriber even though that might be alternative it might be you know different registrars and stuff throughout the line I think that's what the hospital policy would cover that that initial consent covers for that period of time. But I think you know, where it is outside of those ongoing patients, then it should be the prescriber and it should be for those single episodes. But it is up to your hospital policy to state that and state that clearly. Okay. Um, on behalf of everyone here, Lindley and Claire, thank you very much. As, as I said, and certainly from personal experience, this is a really complex area and uh, very much appreciated your presentation today.